Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Lucas Shipway. Hernan Pintos Lopez is um, over there waiting to speak to you uh, a bit later on. Uh, we're going to speak to you this evening about uh, class actions, uh, trends and recent developments. And uh, I wanted to start with a brief overview of what I'm going to cover and, uh, and then I'll hand over to, before I hand over to Hernan, about halfway through this evening. Um, the last time um, I at least gave a presentation about class actions was at the start of 2021. Um, it's nice to be back together in person. We won't mention what got in the way of that the last few years. Um, uh, but uh, some of the cases that I'm going to mention uh, this evening are cases which I talked about then. So partly the aim is to give you an update about those cases and what's been happening uh, in some of those interesting cases lately. But I was going to start, before I do that, talking about some of the trends in class action which we've seen in, in Australia more generally in the last year or so. Um, when I come to the notable cases, I'm going to touch on the Opal Tower case and a, a particular aspect of that, which was the decision by His Honour Justice Black to reduce the commission that he allowed to the funder I'm going to talk briefly about the Ruby Princess case, which is a case that Hernan was involved in. Uh, and then lastly, I'll touch on the light rail uh, class action, which was a claim in nuisance, um, which I was involved in late last year. And again, I'll just be touching on one aspect of that case um, to try to highlight a point again in relation to funding, which I think was interesting from that case. Um, I'll finish by looking ahead a little bit and then Hernan will uh, talk to you about the assessment of damages in, in class actions. Um, if we look at the trends, the filings in uh, 2022 of class actions across Australia were down um, somewhat, uh, actually by a significant amount compared to previous years. Uh, there, were, there were 28 class actions filed in in the year, in the calendar year 2022, compared to a much higher number, 61 in 2020 and 50 in 2021, that might partly reflect the ebbing of the tide of of banking cases arising out of the Royal Commission. Uh, it might also reflect the fact that there, there may have been some front loading of cases uh, in those earlier years to try to get in before some legislative reform came into effect, which was being mooted by the coalition government. Um, that, that government proposed various reforms that were aimed broadly at making it harder for uh, funders to um, uh, sponsor class actions. Uh, for example, the, the, there was um, uh, regulations, I think, uh, that were passed that were made and would make um, funding, uh, 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 deem, uh, deem funding arrangements as managed investment schemes, which brings with it a whole lot of extra regulatory requirements. Uh, there was also a proposal to introduce a rebuttable presumption that uh, the claimants in a claim, the group members, should receive 70% of the proceeds of any action so as to limit the funder's return. Um, that was legislation which, which, was, which was, I think, put to Parliament by the Coalition but really died pretty quickly, didn't get much support and the Labor government um, indicated that it wasn't going to press ahead with that, and I think in relation to management investment schemes, that's also been wound back. So there's been a bit of a change in the legislative uh, landscape, which has is, is turned out, I think, to perhaps offer the, offer the prospect of, of more class actions rather than fewer, uh, but there was perhaps a rush to get those class actions filed in those earlier years. There's also, uh, it's worth noting that there's been a reduction in the number of competing class actions. By that I mean... Uh, a single incident or a single course of conduct giving rise to multiple um, filings and then a process by which they, they, they are um, uh, whittled down to a single one that's allowed to take, be taken forward. That, that you might be aware, was, a, was an area of, 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 of um, some activity. Uh, that's faded a little bit, um, partly perhaps because of the procedures having been better down a little bit. People know where they stand. Um, it's hard to know whether that's what's going on there, but that's reduced a bit. Um, in relation to the types of claims that have been brought as class actions, 
In 2022, they split in the way I've described on the, on the slide. About 60% were consumer and shareholder claims, and particularly um, claims, consumer claims in relation to automotive defects, and I'll come to those in a, in a moment. Um, that that um, 60% includes um, claims in relation to, for example, data breaches, and I'll, I'll mention those again. Uh, building defects, travel claims for disappointment in relation to travel, for example, cosmetic surgery, that sort of thing. Uh, shareholder claims, which we've seen in this area for some time, they, they seem to be remaining pretty steady. About 15% of the filings were employee actions, uh, wages unpaid, that sort of thing. 15% uh, were public interest or classified as public interest um, claims in relation to public housing, claims in relation to what are said to be inappropriate strip searching of young people, um, treatment of young detainees, claims of that kind. And the last 10% is, is sort of investor claims, which again have been a, a hallmark of class actions for some time. I should indicate that I'm, I, I'm, I'm taking these figures from some material that's been published by Allens, which um, uh, seems to me to very, very well summarise and categorise these claims. Um, in relation to where they're being brought, 60% were in the Federal Court. About 30% were brought in the Supreme Court of Victoria, which is an increase on previous years. That's probably a reflection of the fact that um, Victoria, in I think a reflection of the Australian Law Reform Commission's recommendations, has um, uh, m made it easier to get common, common fund orders, and I'll come back to talk a bit about those, which again is is seen as as funder friendly. It's it's seen as class action friendly. So that may be behind that that lift in claims being filed in Victoria. About nine percent were filed here in the Supreme Court of New South Wales, and the rest in um, other places. And particularly a claim brought in the Supreme Court of Tasmania, my home state, um, the first one since the regime was introduced there in 2019. That's a claim in relation to uh, um, conduct over, over many decades at a, a detention centre, a youth um, correctional facility in the north of the state. Um, so you'd probably put that in that category of public action, public interest actions. Um, I said I'd mention the sorts of cases that have been um, brought. One of the, one of the um, big stories last year, of course, was the, the data breach for each of Optus and Medibank. Uh, Optus hasn't seen a class action arising from that so far. Medibank has. Uh, there were initially steps taken under the Privacy Act. But in February this year, Baker and McKenzie filed a, a class action in the federal court um, alleging uh, breach of contract, contraventions of the ACL uh, and, and breach of, con of confidence. The, the Labor government has, has foreshadowed tightening the privacy laws and so it may be that we're going to see more of these sorts of cases. Um, uh, the, the risk, of course, of, of data breach uh, is, is an ever-present one. No doubt um, firms are taking all the steps they can to tighten their uh, firewalls and their protections, but no, no system is perfect. So we can expect, I think, to see more of that as as more and more data is collected and, and the interest in that data from, from um, actors seeking to get a commercial benefit or perhaps a political one is, uh, is probably growing. Um, there were a number of class actions arising or relating to defects in motor cars um, over the last little while. Um, th three of them I just wanted to touch on because I think they illustrate well the the role that class actions can play, which is perhaps a little a little different, has, has a, certain, a certain character which perhaps cases brought by individual plaintiffs won't typically have. Uh, Williams and Toyota in the federal court and Capic and Ford in the federal court and Dwyer and Volkswagen in, in the New South Wales Supreme Court. In each of them there were allegations of defects that meant that an entire class of vehicles was not of acceptable quality. So it's not so much that you're saying that you, you've got a dud, as it were, but rather that there's a sort of a, a, a set of vehicles which have some characteristic, and that's why it's a class action. You've got a sufficient number of 
of, of um, plaintiffs or, or pe persons affected, uh, and the, and and that's the, the aspect of this that I'm that I have in mind. That is that um, th th this is these are mass consumer goods sold in large numbers, and uh, the characteristic is common to multiple vehicles. Um, some things that emerge from those cases are that, um, f f first of all, as, a, as consumers, people expect more of their motor cars than just that they'll, they'll move them from A to B. Uh, um, in, in the Williams case, uh, a Toyota, I think, said, well, the motor car was, was still able to convey the, the purchase of the consumer from point A to point B, but the court said, well, no, that's people expect more and they're entitled to expect more than that from their motor, motor cars. Um, in in CAPIC, the defendant made the argument that the vehicles were, were at a cheaper end, at the cheaper end of the spectrum, and therefore consumers couldn't expect perhaps what they might expect from a more expensive vehicle. And again, the court said, well, no, no they're still quite expensive, <laughs> um, relatively speaking. And so again, there's an expectation of appropriate quality. Uh, and finally, um, in all three cases, the, the courts um, found that there was a breach of the acceptable quality guarantee even if the particular defect had not manifest in, the, in a particular car, which again I think is interesting and whether that can be extrapolated out to other consumer claims will of course depend on all the, all the circumstances. But you can see how that, that's a finding that might be made in a class action context which, which doesn't arise where, where a person is bringing a case, case in respect of their single vehicle. Um, so just quickly dealing with talking about the, the issues in each case. In, in Williams and Toyota, the issue related to the diesel particulate filter, 250,000 vehicles affected. If the cars, if the vehicles were driven at um, 100 kilometres an hour, then there were various nasty consequences um, and they were held not to be of acceptable quality. In CAPIC, about 73,000 vehicles were affected the issue was with the transmission and um, as a result of the issue, vehicles had a propensity to experience shuddering, rattling, harsh gear shifts and ultimately a loss of transmission engagement, not of acceptable quality. Uh, in the Volkswagen case, 83,000 group members and in this case the issue was related to airbags uh, but the court found that the vehicles were of acceptable quality as the plaintiff had failed to establish a relevant risk of malfunction. So that there was a perhaps a propensity for the airbags to malfunction, but the court found, um, having regard to all the evidence, that that risk or that propensity was not sufficient to qualify as a risk which breached the acceptable quality requirements under the Australian Consumer Law. Um, coming then to some of the cases which uh, I talked about a little while ago, um, or last time I, I gave a presentation on, on, on class actions and where we've got to, but um, uh, in Opal Tower uh, was due to be heard late last year. That's the class action arising from the defects in the Opal Tower at Homebush. Um, uh, the matter settled on the court steps, uh, and I'll come back to the decision of Justice Black in relation to the uh, Funding Commission. The second one on the slide is the Sydney Light Rail class action. That was a class action brought on behalf of businesses and residents along the route of the light rail in relation to the nuisance that they alleged was uh, caused by the construction process. Those of you who live in Sydney might recall that the project took much, much longer than was forecast by the government and uh, George Street in particular was, was boarded up in various parts at various stages for very long periods of time. And there was, of course, then noise and construction dust and so on. So that was a case in which damages for that um, conduct was sought. It was heard by Justice Kavanagh and his honour is currently reserved. Uh, the third case on the screen is the Ruby Princess 
that's the case in relation to the COVID outbreak on that cruise ship heard late 2022 also reserved. Uh, finally, um, there's a class action on foot at the moment in relation to aluminium composite panels on buildings. <coughs> it's a claim brought by a, an, an owners corporation as a representative plaintiff seeking damages for the cost to replace this cladding on buildings. The claim is brought um, under the ACL primarily, um, alleging that the, the panels are not of merchant, merchantable quality and so on by virtue of their combustibility. Uh, that's a case which is currently going through its interlocutory phase and is due to be heard in late 2024 in the federal court. Um, in the Opal Tower case, once the settlement had been reached between the parties, the plaintiff sought an order in the usual way, approving the settlement, uh, pursuant to Section 173 of the Civil Procedure Act. Um, Ruth Higgins was appointed by the court as a contradictor. That's a process which is available to the court to ensure that the court has before it not just the plaintiffs and the funder and other parties who are all saying we've settled, uh, but also someone who is putting uh, a contrary position insofar as it needs to be put about, for example, the uh, commission that the funder says it should be paid as part of the settlement. There were 383 group members. Um, they are people who owned a lot in the tower. 341 of them had signed up to a funding agreement. So, as I'm sure you're aware, that's an agreement that um, is offered by the funder and has in it various terms, including that the funder is going to take a cut of the settlement. Uh, the funder also took out what's called after-the-event insurance, which again is reasonably commonplace. That's insurance that will cover the funder in, in the event that the funder or the, the plaintiffs lose the case and there's a cost order made against the plaintiffs. Uh, group members in class actions are not liable to pay the costs if the claim fails. The, the funder will pay those costs, and the way the funder finances that is by way of, usually, by way of insurance of that kind. So there's a price, there's a premium that has to be paid for that. And so the funder did that and, 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 um, and sought to recover the premium from the settlement payment. Okay, so there was a notice that went out to the group members inviting them to approve the settlement and giving them an indication as to what total amount would be distributed between them. That was an amount of $24.6 million. Uh, there were only three emails, according to His Honour Justice Black's judgment, that indicated perhaps some difficulty with the settlement, but the suggestion was that they were pretty mild. So the view was put by the plaintiffs and the funder to his honour that everyone's happy with this deal. The funder's commission was 26%, which was probably, well, I don't know whether it's market, but it's not outrageous. Um, but that wasn't put, that wasn't disclosed to the group members in the, in the invitation to, to agree or consent to the settlement. And nor was the, uh, the amount that was being paid as a premium for the insurance. His Honour thought that undermined the weight that was to be given to the fact that the group members had, had endorsed the settlement. His Honour said that the question as to whether he should approve the settlement was a multifactorial, involved a multifactorial test. Um, it, it takes account of the funders' interests, so it's a realistic, pragmatic test. Uh, it looks at, um, he, His Honour referred to the Belitho case, it looks at a, what is a fair and reasonable return for the funder. So it's not just a, a case of looking at the value of the settlement in the hands of the group members, but it's looking at the commercial realities, as it were, of the funding arrangement. In this case, there was no evidence from the funder that, would, that assisted the court to understand how to apply that test. Um, the, 
the argument about in favour of the settlement was really pitched at, well, this is a you know we're getting a reasonable payout. It's going to be distributed between the between group members, um, and it should be approved on that basis. Um, his honour declined to do that. His honour capped, in effect, the proceeds to the funder and the insurance at 25%. So whereas uh, I think I indicated that it added up to about 36.4% on what the funder had proposed, his honour cut it back to 25 And he said at paragraph 69, courts should be vigilant to ensure that litigation funders are not recovering funding commissions or other deductions which they cannot or choose not to justify. That's a reference, obviously, to the lack of evidence. And the trend to increased scrutiny of funding arrangements in recent case law is to be welcomed. Now, his honours decision is currently on appeal, uh, and so it'll be interesting to see whether it survives the appeal. Uh, his honour also made an order uh, for a funding equalisation order. That's an order that spreads the cost of the proceedings across all group members, not just the 343-odd who had signed up with the fund. Okay, so the idea there is that you shouldn't have some people who hold out and don't sign up who of, who get the proceeds, because every, every group member gets get some proceeds, but don't have to share any of the costs of the proceedings. So that's a kind of compulsory sharing of cost measure. Interestingly, the, the costs in that case were about $6.5 million. Um, His Honour was content to, on the basis of, of a cost assessor's evidence, was consent, content to treat that as, as a reasonable amount. But it's obviously a considerable sum of money. Um, turning to the Ruby Princess case, the interesting feature of this that I wanted to draw your attention to is that um, there was a, a, a subgroup of passengers on the cruise ship who had bought their tickets um, pursuant to um, t terms of carriage under American law, US law. Um, that all depended, I think, on, on where they bought their tickets. They, the, the relevant um, group member bought his tickets online, but in any event, there was a subgroup who were affected in this way. And those US terms of carriage had in them uh, a US choice of law clause or a clause giving exclusive jurisdiction to the US courts, uh, that is, courts in California. And secondly, importantly, a, a clause waiving the passenger's entitlement to um, participate in a class action. Now, the uh, defendant um, sought to have that subgroup shut out from any recovery on the basis that they'd waived their right. The uh, judge at first instance uh, refused that application, but on appeal, the defendant was successful uh, and um, the full court held, among other things, that that waiver of um, right to participate in a class action was not an unfair term under the Australian Consumer Law. That was one of the arguments that was run. Um, there was also, obviously, as you'd imagine, a, a lot of treatment of, of whether those terms were properly incorporated. You remember the ticketing cases that brought, those, brought up those principles. The impact of that decision on, on, on Australian consumer contracts is a little uncertain because it was a case involving a, a US provision um, a, a, or a provision couched in, in the context of a US um, contract. There's also a special leave application which is as I understand it, currently pending. Um, the next case I wanted to talk about, as I foreshadowed, was the, is the light rail case. Now, uh, in this case, the, the only feature of this that I wanted to raise was a point which uh, I don't think is going to find its way into the judgment. It was raised in argument, um, but as you probably know, class actions in, involve the, the court answering what, is, what are called common questions. And so they are the questions which are identified as being common 
to the issues affecting all of, group, all of the group members. So in the case of light rail, um, uh, in summary, that they were questions along the lines of whether, whether a nuisance had occurred, um, that sort of thing. Uh, and then there would be, presumably, down the track, a, an assessment about damages due to individual uh, group members because each of them would be affected in a different way, a business in George Street compared to a business in Surrey Hills or in, on Anzac Parade, for example, would be affected in different ways. So, you, so there's a common question as to the, the common issues and then perhaps a later adjudication as to other issues. And Hernan, I think, will talk about some of those matters in a moment. Uh, one of the... It was suggested or, or, or floated that there would be a common question as to whether the, the costs of funding, that is that percentage we saw in relation to Opal Tower, that was paid to the funder as as a as a profit really on the on taking the risk, whether that should be borne by the defendant, so that if the cost in the Opal Tower case, let's say it's a hundred dollars for argument's sake to fix the problem. If there's a 25% funding commission, the defendant should be liable for $125 so that the group members get 100 the funder gets 25 That's not usually how it's done. It's usually done the, the damages are 100 and the funder takes a cut so that what group members get is, is reduced um, compared to what they're entitled to and that's seen as the price, as it were, of this model. The argument that was that there's some authority um, for the suggestion that it should that the funding should be ahead of damages that's put on top, and this is really the leading case. It's it's not a it's not a decision in the class action context. It's twenty years ago, twenty years old plus. Um, it, it's a case from Queensland, but the point is, I think you'll see the point. The, the judge here is making this, he puts it this way, the respondents' breaches, in that case, caused money to be owing. If they knew that Lindoro, the plaintiff, would be unable to operate without that money, it's arguable they must have known that in that event it would be unable to finance litigation to recover it. That argument assumes, as the appellant has contended, that litigation finance comes at a higher price than ordinary business loans it is the extra cost of that finance caused by the appellant's foreseen impecuniosity, which is arguably recoverable, right? So that the argument is that the defendant has caused the plaintiff's impecuniosity, foresaw that impecuniosity. The result of that impecuniosity is that the plaintiff has to go and pay a funding cost, an extra funding cost, to fund the litigation to, be, to recover relief and applying a usually Hadley and Baxendale type test or, a, or a, in a negligence case a foreseeability test, the, the cost of doing that really should be sheeted home to the defendant. The plaintiff shouldn't wear that cost. Um, the, the, the English courts have, in the case on the, on the, on the slide, endorsed the idea of litigation funding as a head of damage but not at a higher level. Um, certainly not House of Lords Supreme Court. Um, as a principle, an analogous principle, non-legal litigation costs are sometimes recoverable. Uh, costs of, of, of managing a case, for example, that you aren't paying to a lawyer but you are incurring, can be can be recoverable. Um, uh, so it's an interesting area. It's yet I don't as I, say, I don't think Kavanaugh is going to grapple with it because. Uh, the view was that it wasn't necessarily a common question that should be grappled with now, but it's one that's perhaps waiting to be dealt with at some future occasion. Um, that's the point, that, that's the argument that was made in, by the plaintiffs in, in Hunt Leather. If you apply the usual test for remoteness of damages in nuisance, at the time of the nuisance, legal proceedings were reasonably foreseeable as a consequence of the nuisance. It was reasonably foreseeable that members of the class would obtain litigation funding because 
class actions are now really part of the, of the landscape. So if you cause a nuisance, then you should be taken to anticipate that you might face class action and therefore aren't the costs of that class action to the plaintiffs a foreseeable loss. Um, I'll finish on this slide. I don't want to be too gloomy about it, but if we look ahead at, at, the, at the gathering storm clouds, we might conclude that a recession is, is in our future. Um, what, does that, what is that likely to do to class actions? Well, it's always a bit hard to, to say, but uh, there was an inter some interesting um, research done in the US. Um, it, 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 this, if there is a recession, it'll be the first recession seen by the sort of modern class action litigation industry. <laughs> In the, in, the, in the Great Recession of 07, 08, 09, that, that industry was sort of in, in embryonic form. So it's a bit hard to say. Um, the general view amongst attorneys in the US, according to a recent survey, is that, is that litigation finance deal volume is likely to increase. Uh, litigation tends to be a little bit counter-cyclical, right? It's, it's, firms are, are perhaps out there looking to recover when things start going south. And so that might mean litigation picks up a bit um, and that might be reflected in class actions. Um, litigation through a class action is also unusual because it, it, the costs of it are, are shifted off to the funder. So you can perhaps say to management, I think we should pursue this claim and we don't have to pay for it because it's going to be paid for by others with insurance and so on. We just get an upside and we'll, let's roll the dice and see how we go. So... That's an interesting observation. Um, uh, it may be that on the other side of the coin um, that if there's a, a tightening in the market generally, that may result in, the, in funders getting into trouble, some tightening of the market of, in, in relation to um, the consolidation of, of funders. Um, and it, it, it should, I should say that I'm talking here based on some US research. The Australian market is not as mature and different in a number of respects, but the funders are often overseas funders. So the funder in Opal Tower was, an, was a US funder um, and they're often international. So we are in, connected into the international market. Um, it may be that some funders that were, were launched in happier times will have um, taken on risks and so on that perhaps now they can't carry. So we'll see um, how that plays out. That's all I wanted to say. I will hand over to Hernan. Okay, thanks very much, Lucas. Um, I should clarify before I kick on that um, uh, I did actually appear in the Ruby Princess case, but I wasn't involved in the application that dealt with the waiver Point. I was involved in the trial that ran in October, November last year. So I can't tell you an awful lot about um, jurisdiction and waiver, but can tell you about some other things. Um, so uh, I just wanted to touch on some of the challenges that relate to the assessment of damages in class action cases. And uh, uh, I wouldn't say it's a, a great secret. It's, it's fairly well known that these are the challenges that are presented when you're dealing with large, complex proceedings. But uh, this is really designed, uh, directed, I guess, at uh, people who work in the space but don't necessarily uh, have uh, a very detailed sort of knowledge of the framework. And this is a fairly, uh, as you'd expect for this kind of presentation, it's a general introduction to the, the ideas. But really, as Lucas was saying before, um, I'm, I'm going to be focusing on the Federal Court of Australia Act. Uh, clearly, th there are parallel provisions in other states, uh, and uh, in particular in New South Wales, there's similar provisions. So a lot of these observations will be similar. Um, but what, so what's interesting here is that in the Act, Section 33C uh, is sort of a, a central provision, if you like, in the framework. Uh, but importantly, Section 33C2, proceedings can be commenced whether or not the relief sought is the same for each person. And that, that is important because what it means is that you can aggregate in a group people who have common factual circumstances 
but the damage of circumstances may all be quite distinct. Uh, now, Justice Lee, in the case of Dzinski and Gibson, uh, uh, which was a case arising, I think, out of the MH17 flight, uh, uh, talked about claims and talked about uh, the meaning of claims and, and concluded that uh, claims are broader than causes of action. Uh, and uh, it, it's important to understand that one applicant could have many claims and in fact, or, or more than one claim, uh, but that uh, it's really uh, the, what's being aggregated in a, in a class action are the persons, they're the persons who have those claims. Now, just briefly, Section 33Z deals with the power of the court to determine common issues of law and fact, which is what Lucas was talking about, and also to grant relief. Um, now, the two key provisions within that are 33Z1E and 33Z1F. Uh, Subsection E deals with the making of an award of damages, and subsection F deals with an unusual power, which is the power to award damages in an aggregate amount without specifying the amounts for individuals. Now, I'll come to that at the end because I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting feature of the framework and it's not one that uh, really appears very often. There aren't a lot of cases that deal with it, but there have been some important cases in that space in the last couple of years. Uh, and it's worth maybe touching on that a bit at the end. So, important to note that in cases for aggregate damages under 33Z1F, uh, the court is not to make such an order unless a reasonably accurate assessment can be made. Um, and there's some, some interesting case law on that, uh, which I'll, I'll touch on a bit later. Um, now, skipping on through, I just wanted to touch very briefly on the idea of res judicata. It won't be a law lecture. I'm just going to talk about the idea that, I mean, ordinarily, in ordinary proceedings, proceedings are binding on the parties who participate. But one of the key features of class actions, which I'm sure many of you already know, uh, is that group members are not parties. They don't have to pay costs and they're not bound by the determination, the class action, except insofar as it determines the common issues. And so under the normal uh, principles of, of res judicata and issue estoppel and the things that go with it, uh, it can have some, uh, some, some interesting consequences. One of them, for example, came up in a high court case of Timber Corp Finance, where it was argued uh, that uh, certain group members couldn't bring legal claims uh, because they hadn't been raised in an earlier class action on an ancient estoppel basis. And in that case, the, plur the plurality, uh, Justices, Chief Justice French, Justices Kiefel, Keen and Nettle, um, held that the lead plaintiff wasn't privy in interest of the relevant group members. Uh, with respect to their individual claims and moreover that, that there was no, uh, no reason why they would be expected or why it would be reasonable to expect them to bring their claims in the class action given that group members don't control class actions. So they have limited control and limited involvement there. Um, so what's interesting about that though is that it's inherent in that concept that you don't necessarily need uh, you may not need the statutory provision uh, to deal with it, but we do have um, the statutory provision, which is Section 33ZB, which gives statutory effect. That's, that's the, uh, a provision which Justice Lee described as the most important in Part 4. Um, it's the mechanism that binds all of the group members in respect to the common questions except those who've opted out. So, and in Dzinski and Gibson, uh, Justice Lee um, 
I, I thought this was an interesting uh, observation uh, because it's necessarily in the nature of the claims that are brought that the, the answer to the common questions might but might not determine the individual claims of group members. It depends on the nature of the claim, the nature of the answer. Uh, but where it's not determinative, it's necessary for group members' claims to be addressed somewhere else, be determined in some other place, some other... Uh, and that's usually following a declassing order, but there's great flexibility in Part 4A. So the, the framework is one that I think the hallmark of it is procedural flexibility. Uh, so there are ways in which the court can continue the proceedings to determine the next stage following an initial trial or can separate. Uh, so, for example, Section 33Q gives the court the power to create subgroups and subgroup representatives, uh, and, but can also direct particular group members to conduct separate proceedings. So, um, ordinarily, uh, the court will proceed to determine all the claims of the representative, of the lead applicant, if you like, and sometimes there may be more than one applicant. Uh, and that includes all of the claims for damages and relief of that individual. Uh, and in doing so, they determine the common issues that affect other, other um, group members. But you can see just in the range of some of the different sorts of claims that are brought as class actions, how different the assessment of damages can be. So, for example, you've got cases like say, Windsor Caribbean Shire Council and Lehman Brothers, which was a case uh, that followed on from the financial crisis about certain financial instruments that different councils had invested in. Um, very, very complex litigation, which was ultimately settled. Um, you've got cases like um, Capic and Ford, which Lucas was talking about. Uh, so those are automotive product liability type cases. Um, but you also have things like um, natural disasters, bushfires and floods, and I've done more than a few bushfire cases, uh, and I was in Johnston, uh, although not necessarily in that application. But what's interesting about that case is it illustrates, just the factual introduction illustrates the... Um, in Johnston, for example, it was bushfire in Springwood, whole number of people involved, property damage, uh, uh, allegations of negligence against the power company, uh, but also some personal injury. And if you had to assess damages, that case ultimately settled. Had it not settled, uh, the sorts of issues you would need to deal with are, uh, uh, you know, quite, quite distinct. Uh, and finally, just you've got some personal injury cases, uh, such as the fairly well-known case of Gill and Ethic on Sale, which is the pelvic mesh class action, uh, which uh, is fairly important development in that case, uh, it was, uh, in fact, this year there have been two judgments in the federal court, um, number 10 and number 11. And now number 10 is uh, important because uh, the court approved a settlement of about $300 million in, the, in that class action, in the Gill proceeding and a, another related proceeding. So there are still some fights going on about how that's to be administered and how the administration is to be run, um, but they are some, some very large numbers and, and obviously affecting uh, large numbers of people. So that's why I'm touching on settlement here because that's commonly the most, it's the most common avenue by which class actions come to a conclusion, uh, whether it be by settlement before the initial trial or settlement after an initial trial. Uh, but one of the key differences between class actions and ordinary litigation is the court must approve settlement because it affects the interests of uh, group members. Uh, and I just wanted to mention there, there's a, a, a good summary of the, just a very brief summary, but a very good summary of the principles in Webb and Get Swift. Um, but ultimately, what the court is concerned with is the fairness uh, of the settlement, whether it's fair and reasonable, 
whether it's into the interests of group members as a whole, but also as a question of justice as between them. So that's important. One of the challenges that you often face in dealing with uh, quantum in a class action context is because group members may not be known to the applicant or the applicant's lawyers, um, there may be, there's almost certainly no evidence about them and we don't, you, you may not necessarily know very much about them or the nature of their claim. So how do you estimate what a settlement is worth? It's one of the great challenges. Uh, and certainly there's no requirement uh, that, uh, that members of a class be known uh, or even that any information about them be available or provided. Now, I'm not suggesting there should be such a requirement, but it's one of the challenges when we operate in, in this space. Um, so often what you get with a settlement is an agreement on a global amount, and quite often you also get an agreement on um, mechanisms for distributing and mechanisms for assessing the relative values of claims within the within the class. And that can be quite substantial. So for example, in the pelvic mesh case, uh, the solicitors for the applicant estimated it was going to cost them about $36.8 million to administer the $300 million settlement. That's one of the reasons why that battle is still going. Uh, court wasn't very happy about that and there's some to and fro there, but it, it's just a, a, you can see if it's going to cost that amount of money to administer an agreed scheme, what it would potentially cost to run all kinds of cases through the system. So, um, and I thought this, uh, uh, this observation by uh, Justice Whitney in the Stanford case uh, is, a, is an interesting one because it highlights the, the problems. This is a, a settlement approval but talking about the issues faced by the applicants, even if successful on any appeal, if the matter was to be litigated to finality, it would have been necessary for a further trial or a series of further trials to be conducted in relation to the assessment of damages and the need for lay and expert evidence in each of those cases. So you can see why settlement, uh, you know, once those common issues are determined, uh, hopefully, you know, uh, people can come to uh, some sort of reasonable uh, outcome. So finally, I will touch on aggregate damages. Uh, as I said before, you've got the framework there for aggregate damages. There's been some important discussions in recent times about that in Williams, which is one of the cases that Lucas spoke about. Uh, what we've seen there uh, in particular is that uh, so in the 2021 case uh, Williams uh, Justice Lee uh, undertook a, uh, an extensive analysis of the power and whether it required the court uh, to give an order of aggregate damages for all of the claims uh, his honour found that it didn't and that aggregate damages could be awarded in respect of part of the claims. Uh, but in the, in the follow-up case, in the 2022 case, uh, His Honour in fact declined to make orders as to aggregate damages, uh, but in fact arrived for some of the groups, arrived at the same outcome by, by just the ordinary um, 33Z1E approach. Uh, because his honour observed that a degree of estimation is necessarily part of the law of damages. Uh, now, in Brady, it's interesting because Justice Markovic, in that case, declined to allow the issue of aggregate damages to be determined in the initial trial. There was a dispute about that, but ultimately... Uh, her Honour reached that view because the applicant in that case hadn't in fact uh, arrived at a methodology for how aggregate damages would be determined and there were issues about how 
different classes would be affected. Um, so noting the time, uh, I just thought it'd be useful to end uh, with, um, obviously in different proceedings, uh, uh, certainly the, the evidence, the, the, the position may be one where it's uh, potentially ripe to ask for aggregate damages, but the court has to do it by evidence. It's not a license to guess. And uh, as uh, uh, His Honour Justice Perham said in, in CAPIC, uh, since it's not presently known which group members have which causes of action for reduction in value, the question of whether there can be aggregation does not yet arise. So His Honour in that case didn't say you can't have aggregate damages, just you can't have aggregate damages at this point. But that's why I think it's, it's important to end with uh, the... Um, sorry, I did want to make one more comment from Justice Lee from the, the Williams case. Um, I, I, I did like this quote. Although sometimes it might seem the case procedurally, class actions are not the litigation equivalent of the Galapagos Islands. The hinterland of the broader law of damages must inform the analysis undertaken in addressing compensatory issues in the present, present context. So 33Z1F permits a degree of estimation, but it doesn't allow the court to award damages without a factual foundation in evidence. So does anybody have uh, any questions uh, for either Lucas uh, or myself? I appreciate that this stage in the evening, it's uh, the attraction of uh, the camping for drinks is, is, is great. I actually had a question about the, the, the case where a, an owner's corporation um, brought a claim regarding cladding. Um, noting that cladding is common property, why was it a representative proceeding? That's, that, that's a very, I want to come over to the microphone. Mm, yep. yep. um, that, that's a very good question. Um, the, the claim that was brought um, as a class action was a claim for loss of value, diminution in value of the lots. Right. Um, and so uh, it was actually, in the end, attached to a conventional owner's corp type claim seeking uh, the cost to fix the common property. So that was how that was dealt with. But yes, it was a, um, a little bit unusual in the sense that it was a claim about a building defect, but really it was a claim for, for, for diminution in value caused by a stigma. So that's why the, it was brought in that feature, because the owners corp can't bring a claim for that loss. Um, almost definitely can't. Certainly that's how the lot owners approached it. Any other questions? I might just finish with an observation which struck me. Sorry, Hannah. Um, uh, which is that, that, that the, the question of the, the quantification of aggregate damages probably intersects with that question I talked about, about the funding, the value, whether you can recover the funding. Because you might say, well, if, if you're seeking aggregate damages under that special provision, which is a, which is a creature or a feature of the framework, dedicated to class actions, you might say, well, that's that doesn't that hint at the idea that perhaps our aggregate damages should be calculated having regard to the fee we've got to pay through no fault of our own to the funder. But that can await another case. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I haven't got any questions on the live stream, I don't think. So I think we can repair to the drinks table. Thanks very much.